betrayals, attacks, and weird pairings. Some games put you in some awkward situations. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 games that force you to fight your partner or party member. Also, before we get going, one thing we're not doing is characters who come back evil in sequels. As much as we would like the excuse to talk about Army of Two, The Devil's Cartel, that game is not showing up on this list. It's stuff that happens in a single game. And just to be clear, it's only going to be partners or party members, not the mentor on the codec who turns out to be bad all along. Team members. So without any further ado, at number 10 is Divinity Original Sin 2. This is a unique one because you don't necessarily have to fight your party in this game. It can be avoided, but there are so many moments where it can happen that it's something most players probably will experience, especially if you're playing co-op. At the end, you're pretty much guaranteed to fight each other if you choose the most obvious ending. So how this works is that for the entire game, you're basically trying to become the new divine, the god of the world, essentially. When you get to the end, the game gives you the option of ascending or not ascending. Then, thing is, the other characters in your party also want to ascend for their own reasons, and depending on how you play the game, will either try to fight you for it or let you have it if they're loyal enough for you. Which means it's technically possible to avoid fighting your party, but because of how the game works, it's pretty likely you'll end up fighting them. I mean, at very least one of them. And if you're online, the chances are a lot worse, because if a friend is playing as one of your allies and earlier in the game agreed to become the Divine, then you're immediately launched into combat to decide which one gets to become the new god in these parts. So again, it can be avoided if only one person in your party agrees to become the Divine, but let's be real, unless you already know what's coming, that's probably not going to happen. I'm putting this game first because while it's an edge case and fighting your party is potentially avoidable, it's probably going to happen. And number 9 is A Way Out, uh, the 2018 co-op game, which does some pretty fun things with its two-player premise, but it saves the biggest surprise for the ending. The concept of the game starts simple enough. Vincent, the guy with the beard, meets a guy named Leo, the greaser-looking guy, and they conspire to break out of prison. There's an elaborate escape sequence, manhunt, all kinds of crazy stuff that goes down, but after it seems like the story is wrapping up, there is one final twist. Vincent is actually an undercover cop who's been pulling a sting on Leo, and the game ends with a full-on fistfight with one killing the other. This would be pretty intense for a single-player game, but you play out all of this in multiplayer with one person being Vincent and one Leo, so it adds a whole new dimension to the fact that you're fighting each other. The entire game has these two working together, so being forced to fight at the end feels wrong almost. Some players actually went all in trying to kill their former partner, but at least for me, I just didn't want to do it. And if you hold back too much, the other player just wins. It's an all-around cool way to end the game, and it takes what would normally be a pretty standard twist and gives it a lot more impact by having you fight your literal co-op partner. And number 8 is Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, Big Smoke. So, Big Smoke isn't exactly a partner, but the characters of Carl Johnson, Sweet, Ryder, and Big Smoke are about as close as you get to a party in a GTA gang. Like, a gang's basically a party, right? There are a lot of betrayals in these games, many of which you perform yourself, but few have as much impact as when you find out Big Smoke has betrayed you. Sure, you can choose to kill either Michael or Trevor in GTA 5, but that is optional, and you don't really end up fighting them at the end. Hell, there's even Micah from the end of Red Dead 2 or Gary from Bully, but those characters, both allies for a good chunk of the game, are also pretty obviously bad. Big Smoke, in comparison, is not only likable, he's one of the more fun characters in the game. So when he turns on you, the twist is actually really effective. And with Big Smoke, you actually have to fight him. During the final mission of the game, you assault his compound, blow away his army of goons, and then get into a shootout with him mano a mano. It's not exactly as cinematic as A Way Out, but by this time in the game, it's hard not to like Big Smoke. So it sucks. It hits hard. You still have to deal with the real bad guy of the game, too, Tenpenny, after that. But, I mean, Tenpenny was always kind of an asshole. And number seven is Near Replicant. Yeah, we have talked about the whole ending choice in Near, but not we actually doing it. Near is a game, hell a series, where you have to beat the games multiple times before you get the real ending. This is something we've talked about more than enough, I think, but normally the final boss is the same dude every time. It's not until after you finish ending A and B and collect every weapon does the true boss reveals itself uh, in Kane, who just goes berserk out of the blue. Kane's basically the closest thing you have to a human partner for the entire game, and while she starts out 
out pretty acerbic, she eventually starts warming up to the main character. So out of all the characters in the game, she's probably the most fleshed out, most complex, given a ton of backstory. And being forced to fight her at the end is actually pretty tough. I mean, not as an actual battle. It's not really difficult or anything. But at this point, you're probably wondering if there's anything else you can do. No, there isn't. You're forced to kill her no matter what. So what happens afterwards, it can change the ending where you can give up your life to bring her back or not. But the actual fight has to happen. Near Automata actually ends in a kind of similar way, but because of what happens in the story, it's not quite as clear cut if you're fighting a partner or a party member or not. Honestly, both games qualify for the list. The, the original Nier is a little bit more clear cut though. And number six is Xenoblade Chronicles, another RPG, another bunch of betrayals. Big chunk of the antagonists in this game end up being former allies, but I think one particular character stands out from the rest. People who played it probably know that I'm going to say Fiora. It's Fiora. Yeah, Dixon is probably the most obvious example of betrayal. He's the guy who helps you throughout the game and never really joins your party outside of being a guest character once in a while. I would have to classify him as more of a mentor, though, even if his betrayal is the biggest among the characters you know. I say Fiora is a little bit more obvious because she's like that secondary protagonist for a good chunk of the early game. If you spend a lot of time in the first area of the game, you'll be using her a lot. When the enemies of the game, like the Mechaton, attack your town, she's shockingly killed, which sets off the events of the rest of the game. Much later in the game, Fiora comes back, now piloting a giant robot and being controlled by the Mechon, and you have to fight her. It's a situation where having to fight your party actually does have a happy ending, as even though you do have to face her in combat, the bad guys lose control of her and she ends up returning to your party for the rest of the game so it's actually kind of awesome rather than a disappointment but still i mean we had to have at least one positive outcome on this list right just another spoiler alert for you though that's the only one and number five is Knights of the Old Republic 2. Okay, I said mentor characters don't count, but this mentor character is also a full-blown party member, so I want to say that it does count. The Coder games give you a lot of opportunities, actually, to fight your party members, but most of them are optional encounters. This one is not. If you've played the game, you already know where I'm going here. It's Kreia. The cliche Obi-Wan-like Jedi master becomes the ultimate bad guy in the game. Even though it's now one of the most well-known twists out there, it was really surprising back in the day because they played her up exactly as I described her right there. Cliche Obi-Wan stand-in. What makes her so unusual is she's both a former Jedi Master and Sith Master, and unlike most Star Wars characters, is not locked into either ideology. She was testing your morality by playing Devil's Advocate, whether you're doing light side actions or dark side one. Now, for most of the game, it doesn't come off as some kind of, oh my god, this is obviously the bad guy thing. Like I said, she slots pretty well into the Obi-Wan role. But at the the end of the game her true goal is revealed to quote unquote free the galaxy from the influence of the force just having someone hate on the force at all was pretty surprising for a star wars game and it instantly made her very interesting and to a lot of people a sympathetic character of course in the end you're not given a choice you have to fight her but there was probably a small section of star wars fans who were like yeah kill the force man and would have totally gone along with her plan and number four is the last story, an action RPG released on the Wii back in 2012. Honestly, one that I consider pretty underrated. It's got some really unusual gameplay, kind of like a JRPG Gears of War. Unlike Coder 2, the guy who betrays you in this game isn't just your mentor. He's literally your best friend and one of the main characters throughout the entire game. This guy, Dagrin. Most of the story revolves around Lazulus Island's war and these orc looking guys, I guess, called the Gurok. But at the end, it's revealed your buddy Dagrin basically orchestrated all these events so you get revenge on the knights who killed his family. You end up having to fight him, and he never really considers you his enemy. He's just a guy who ended up going too far in his quest for revenge. Not a hard thing to do, to be fair. And the battle is the result of it. Keep in mind, this was your main character's best friend, and it's about as dramatic as it gets for a final battle. And the truth regarding his motives isn't revealed until way late in the game, near the end. So yeah, even though this basically spoils the big twist, the last story is a cool game that is worth checking out. I think you'll find it really interesting. And number three is Paper Mario, the Thousand Year Door. The fact there are so many RPGs starring Mario is kind of bizarre when you think about it, but there's also no denying the quality of most of these games. To many, the absolute best Paper Mario is this one, the Thousand Year Door, and probably the most memorable part is in chapter four. Uh, anyone know where I'm going with this? Uh, this ghost guy literally steals Mario's body and all your party members think he's the real Mario. So this isn't just a game where you have to fight your party, you also have to fight yourself. Yeah, because 
because this still counts, the boss fight with your body at the end of the chapter also has one of your party members tagging along just to make things more difficult. Of course, this being a Mario game, everything ends happily. The ghost gets beaten up, Mario gets his body back, everyone feels real awkward about what happened. Like, they should have realized it wasn't him when possessed Mario starts talking because Mario is a silent protagonist. I wouldn't say this one is quite as happy of an ending as the one where you get your party member back because getting your body back after a possession is kind of... And it's still a little grim, you know? Especially for a Mario game. At number two is Middle Earth Shadow of War. You would think a game about being able to dominate and control orcs wouldn't have a lot of big betrayals in it, but that is wrong. One of the main orcs you bring into your budding army fairly early into the game is this big guy named Bruise. He's fairly likable for an orc, so it's easy to get along with him, but he eventually ends up betraying you as part of the main story. This whole storyline is actually kind of a shock because it both throws your army into disarray for a while and forces you to lose one of your best guys at the same time, so it's a case where the betrayal has a ton of effect, more so than other games. It's not just a story thing, it's also a gameplay thing. The whole thing ends on a really dark note too, which has Talion shaming Bruise and bringing him back into the orc army, but totally breaking his mind in the process. So you can still use him, but he's not much fun to have around anymore, he's just totally broken. It's kind of a dark game anyways, but this is one of the more messed up moments in it. And finally, at number one is Double Dragon. The granddaddy of them all, the original Double Dragon arcade game is about as basic as it gets. This is the game that have basically invented beat-em-up games, a whole genre of games. And even though it's kind of difficult to go back to, it's still got all the basics there. There's punching, baseball bats, and it's fun in a brainless kind of way. The plot is just as basic as the gameplay. Some thugs kidnap Marion, Billy and Jimmy have to rescue her. After fighting your way through the game, you face off against the final boss, the customary guy with a gun that most beat-em-ups end with. But once Marion is rescued, the game isn't over. For some reason, Billy and Jimmy have to fight. I guess whoever wins gets the girl, which is kinda ridiculous considering that's not how anything works in real life. But it's also a ridiculous beat-em-up game. Of course, this only happens if you play with two players, and if your friend has a weapon, you're still pretty much screwed. It's still fun though, it's weird and interesting to get a chance to beat your partner up on purpose for once. It's pretty funny to see you have to fight your partner in one of the earliest co-op games out there, but I guess there's no rules in love and war, right? Every man for himself in Double Dragon, I guess. And a quick bonus for you, South Park the Stick of Truth, Princess Kenny. For some reason, South Park keeps popping up on all these lists lately, so I'm just going to shove this one in the bonus section. It fits the list a little too well to be ignored, so yeah. At the end of the game, you're betrayed by Kenny of all people. It's basically an excuse to throw in a you killed Kenny joke, but Kenny is an ally for pretty much the whole game up to this point. Basically, no hints that Kenny would ever betray you show up, so it's kind of a surprise when it happens. The sequel is also chock full of betrayals, and you end up fighting party members like crazy. The games are just full of this stuff. And that's it for today. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications, and as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.